the eleventh hour of the eleventh day of the eleventh month. For how many years has November 11th been observed with acts of remembrance? For over 100 years since the armistice of World War I. A long time ago. I'm not a great history buff necessarily and don't know all, some of the things, but when I look at the history of those 100 years, I don't think there's been in very many years in that period when somewhere in the world there hasn't been some kind of conflict, wars between nations and people. And in the midst of that reality, we must continue to remember. Because we know all too well that war continues to happen today. Injustice continues to happen today. Hatred and violence continues to happen today. We never need to never forget the atrocities of war and injustice. But we also need to never forget our shared desire for respect and dignity among all people, in all places, in all time, as part of our baptismal covenant, and our hope and our trust that that will become a reality. As followers of Jesus Christ and as children of God, intrinsically, we are a people who remember. We tell our story again and again and again, year after year after year. We know the story of our faith. We are always telling the gospel story of God's kingdom and God's love and God's mercy and God's grace in what we do and what we say when we come together in worship and when we go out those doors and live our faith in the world around us, living the covenant of baptism that we have with God, with each other, and with all of creation. It happens every time we gather at that table to share the celebration of the Holy Eucharist or Holy Communion. We gather to tell the story of faith. We gather together to tell our story and to tell God's story and to tell how those two stories intersect in Jesus Christ. And when we remember the story of Jesus and how his story intersects with our story and God's story, we are always telling and being reminded of what our relationship with Jesus is about and how that relationship impacts and influences our calling to be disciples today. As God's story of God's relationship with creation is told, the hope we hold on to for ourselves and for all of creation that we proclaim is in our ministries is that one day there will be peace on earth. As hard as that is to believe or imagine, it is true. There will be peace. And that peace, which Paul reminds us in Philippians 4, is beyond our human understanding or comprehension. And we won't ever come about to that peace through our human endeavors or initiatives. And that peace especially will never happen through war, violence, or hatred. Because what does war, violence, and hatred do that? More war, violence, and hatred. And that's part of our human condition. And it's part of our story as human beings. It is God who will bring about that peace which passes all understanding. When God's reign comes fully into fruition on this earth and God's kingdom is experienced in all of its glory, then we will know peace. Now just because we can't create that peace in and of ourselves, in our human condition, that doesn't mean that we don't have responsibility to do what we can within the context of our own lives, where we work, where we live, where we go to church, where we shop, in our families. That doesn't mean that we can't work for peace there, and justice, and respect, and reconciliation, and advocate alongside the marginalized, who are still so prevalent in our society. When we remember today, 
And when we go remember tomorrow. And when we remember every day. That's a spiritual exercise. There's a spirituality about our remembering. We recognize with gratitude the thanksgiving and thanksgiving the freedoms that we have been blessed with. And we have been blessed with freedoms, not the least of which is to come together and worship as we do here this morning. But we also need to ask ourselves, what can we do? What can we do to ease the burdens and injustice of others in our own community and neighborhood and further afield around the world where it's possible as well? In our first reading from Micah, one of my favorite passages, Micah described in his prophetic word how the children of God will flock to the holy temple of God, and how God will teach them God's ways, and in particular, how God will teach them the way of peace and justice. These are how it was translated in Eugene Peterson's The Message. God will establish justice in the rabble of the nations and settle disputes in faraway places. They'll trade in their swords for shovels, their spears for rakes and hoes, Nations will quit fighting each other. They will quit learning how to kill one another. What a glorious vision, isn't it? And it must have been what those men and women who sacrificed themselves in the great wars of the 20th century must have been hoping for. And likewise, those who sacrifice themselves today as they put themselves in harm's way for the good of others. And then we have our gospel reading. And God, through the words of Jesus himself, as he talked to his disciples, reiterated to them his hope and his ultimate plan for creation. Jesus said, I have said this to you, so that you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. When we look at the world around us and witness the hatred among groups of people, what else can we do but hold on to the faith that God has blessed us with for peace that he promises he will bring to this earth? Every year on November the 11th or the Sunday before, it is important to stop, to reflect, and to remember with gratitude those who fought and gave their lives, who continue to fight and who continue to give their lives in the cause for peace and in the cause for justice. However, for me personally, I can remember going back to when I was a teenager standing at the Cenotaph in Port Dalhousie after the Sunday morning service when they had their parade and their Remembrance Day observance. I can always remember there's equally another step in me to take. Because to remember is to accept responsibility and to do whatever we can, however inconsequential it may seem, to work for peace in the context of where we are right now. And yes, it likely won't bring about world peace, oh, that it were that simple. But we can bring peace and justice and respect and dignity into the relationships we have in our families, in our parish church, in our diocesan church, in our community, in our world. And isn't that at least to start? And isn't that in the right direction of what is God's ultimate hope and God's ultimate desire for the experience of peace in and among all of his creation, starting right there within us? Peace in our hearts, peace in our souls, peace in our experience of life. In 1926, shortly after the introduction of the red poppy in the United Kingdom, there was a group of people who went to the Legion and suggested that the black center of the poppy have these words imprinted upon them, no more war. No more war. And that was because they thought that this should be a symbol that reminds us of the ultimate hope of the armistice. And that request was denied by the Legion. 
And that marked the introduction of the white poppy. And the white poppy is born with the intention of remembering the casualties of war because they need to be remembered. But it added the meaning of a hope for the end of all wars. This is a quote from someone who wore a white poppy and explained why. Wearing red poppies, for me, are not simply a ritual, and not because it's politically correct and a nod towards public expectation. It is an honor, and it is an honor of those who fought and who died, in respect and gratitude for all they did for us. But he went on to say, I wear a white poppy alongside my red one, because I know they fought and some died for my peace. Our peace. I wear both side by side because I believe the nature of remembrance is changing and the nature of remembrance will change as decades pass since those two world wars. Over the last couple of days at Synod, Gail and I sat with other delegates from the Diocese of Toronto, and we sat yesterday with the parishioners of St. Stephen in the Fields in downtown Toronto. If you don't know St. Stephen in the Fields, it's a very, very, very out-of-the-box parish. And um, their work of outreach and social justice is, is the very, very, very core of who they are and what they do. And they were wearing white poppies. And it reminded me to go back and read the story of the white poppy. Because those who wear white poppies today are still judged as having a lack of respect. And yet, they don't have a lack of respect. On the one hand, they are recognizing our calling to remember the past. But they're also saying, pray for peace. The peace those wars and other wars were all about. They're saying it's about both. Some prophetic words from famous people who had something to say about peace. John Lennon. He said, if someone thinks that peace and love are just a cliché that must have been left behind in the 1960s, that's a problem. Because peace and love are eternal. John F. Kennedy said, peace is a daily, a weekly, a monthly process, gradually changing opinions slowly eroding old barriers, quietly building new structures. And Desmond Tutu said, do your little bit for good where you are. It's those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world. Prophetic words from all three of those individuals, I think, as much as my own. Today and tomorrow, let's take the time to remember with all of the traditions of wearing a poppy, let's take our moment of silence. Let's have our parades and marches. Let's listen to the pipes and the drums. Let's hear the poignant moment of the last post. Let's lay our wreaths. Let's hear the speeches from dignitaries. Let's go to the cenotaph at the corner and join the hundreds of people who are there. Let's enter into acts of remembrance with a sense of purpose. Yes, the commitment to promote peace so that swords can be changed into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks so that nation won't lift up sword against nation and we as people in the world will learn war no more. What a glorious vision. And may we remember and may we claim and may we proclaim our faith, our hope, and our trust in the peace of Jesus Christ, which passes all understanding, that offers us courage, no matter what's going on in the world around us. Let's be agents of peace, the peace of Jesus Christ. Let me close with this prayer. God, we pray for the power to be gentle, the strength to be forgiven, the patience to be understanding, and the endurance to accept the consequences of holding to what we believe is right. We put our trust in the power of good to overcome evil, and the power
power of love to overcome hatred. We pray for the vision to see and to the, the faith to believe in a world emancipated from violence. A new world where fear shall no longer be men and women to commit injustice, nor selfishness make us bring suffering to others. Help us to devote our whole life and thought and energy and faith to the task of making peace. Praying always for the inspiration and the power to fulfill the destiny for which we and all people were created. May our response be Amen. May it indeed be so.